sa ano sir. Paano? Ayan sir, sige pa sir. Okay na po. Okay. All right. Uh, let's just uh, review because we did not meet last meeting uh, last week. Uh, we already started with uh, our discussions on constitutional law one. Uh, you already have your outline and syllabus which I gave you. And in fact, I already gave you certain questions so you could do your readings. Uh, we already started with the, the meaning of political law. We already discussed the case of, if you look at your outline, Macariola versus Asuncion. Uh, if you remember, again, in Macariola versus Asuncion, uh, basically, uh, the judge there was uh, charged to have been to, uh, to violate Article 14 of the Code of Commerce because there was a certain case involving a land dispute and ultimately there was a decision made in that case but ultimately the land that was uh, included in that case was later on acquired by his wife and later on by him. So they alleged that uh, Judge Asuncion violated Article 14 of the Code of Commerce because this cited provision prohibits public officers from engaging in any business. So the uh, issue is whether uh, or not he violated Article 14 of the Code of Commerce. Now, if you look at it, the Code of Commerce, take note that this took effect in uh, 1888 under the Spanish regime. And this uh, partook of a political law. Now, when there's a change of sovereignty from Spain to the United States, this Article 14 must have been, is deemed uh, automatically abrogated. Why is it automatically abrogated? Because it's a political law. And when there is a change of sovereignty, the political laws of the former sovereign, whether compatible or not, are automatically abrogated unless they are expressly reenacted by affirmative act of the new sovereign. So he could not have violated uh, this uh, Code of Commerce because there's already a change of sovereignty. And since this Code of Commerce partook of a political law, it was already deemed abrogated. Okay? So uh, that's the case of Macariola versus Asuncion. And more importantly, this case, in this case, the Supreme Court gave the definition of what political law is. Political law is that branch of public law which deals with the organization and operations of the government organs of the state and defines the relations of the state with the inhabitants of its territory. We also discussed, uh, the. if you look at your outline, we uh, defined what constitutional law is, and we took up the different types or kinds of constitutions. We said that uh, the Philippine Constitution is a written constitution, it is conventional or enacted, and it is also a rigid constitution. Uh, it's rigid because it can only be amended or revised by the procedure prescribed by the Constitution itself, right? Which is which we we'll take on in the last part of our discussion on how to amend and revise the Constitution, whether it be through uh, Constituent Assembly or uh, Constitutional Convention or initiative. But we'll learn that uh, later on. All right. So let's look. If you look at your outline, let's officially start with the background of the present constitution. If you look at your outline. The February 1986 revolution and the proclamation of the provisional constitution. Well, we all know there was this uh, EDSA revolution in 86. Uh, were, some of you were already born then, right? Yeah, wala pa, wala pa yung ipanganak, 1986? Wala? Wala pa, sir. Oh. Okay. Sir. Wala pang ipanganak in 1986. Okay. Bata, mangko. Okay? No. I was, I think, seven or eight years old then. All right. Uh, what happened? But you know your history under the EDSA revolution. Remember, there was martial law, 1972 to 1981. Diba? Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back to our history. 1782-81, martial law, Ferdinand Marcos. 83, who was assassinated? Ninoy. 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 Who was assassinated? Ninoy. 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 Binigno, Aquino, Claruana, kay Napun si Ninoy. Okay? Buhi pa si Ninoy. Now, remember there were snap elections. Diba? 
and Marcos won in that snap elections, but the people could not fathom that he won. So there were allegations of cheating, blah, blah, blah. And because of that, uh, there was this, there came about the EDSA revolution, all right? Now remember, uh, Marcos flew from the Philippines, nag-exit, nag-escape. Diba? But before his escape, gani, uh, there was a simultaneous oath-taking, if you know your history. Diba? Since Marcos won in the election, sa Malacan niyang na vote of office siya as president. Pero si Cory, kay ginstall naman siya through the revolutionary process of the EDSA revolution, she also took her office, I think, uh, before at uh, Club Filipino, I think, in San Juan. That was where Cory Aquino took her oath of office before then Chief Justice Claude Jotihanki. On the other hand, Marcos took his oath of office as president dito, I think, sa Malacanang. Now, because of that, di ba, it's a revolution, natanggal si Marcos. Marcos flew to where? Hawaii. 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 In fact, the story was, uh, there are some stories that say that Marcos actually said, let's go to Pauai. Pauai is located in Ilocos, the, the baluarte of the Marcoses. Wala daw na dungog o tarong sa piloto. In this Pauai, ni direkso daw siya, Hawaii. Okay, but that's just a story. What actually happened was he flew on a C-141 and he flew uh, with his family, with Imelda, with their three children, with three grandchildren, with General Fabian Ver, with his wife. All in all, they were a party of 89. The, uh, I know this because I know the pilot of the plane who took Marcos to Hawaii. I cannot mention his full name because he is my client. He's uh, an American covert pilot. Let's just, uh, I'll just call him Steve. Okay? He was the one who flew Marcos. I talked to him personally about this. So, uh, see the, the Marcos party, composed of 89, as well as the 99 pairs of shoes of Imelda, rode the uh, C-141 going to uh, Guam and later on to an undisclosed Air Force, Air Force base in Honolulu. So, mo ng history na to. So, paghawa ni Marcos, here comes Cory Aquino, look at your outline, and she made proclamation number one, dated February 25, 1986. This was where she declared a provisional uh, government, okay, based on human rights, precisely because they wanted this to be the centerpiece, human rights, because of the different martial law abuses during the time of uh, Marcos, okay? And she also issued proclamation number three, declaring a provisional constitution. So in this provisional constitution, there were certain um, articles that were retained and some were not under this provisional constitution. Now, you have the cases in your outline of Lawyers League versus Aquino as well as um, Inre Bermudez, okay? What do these two cases have in common? Well, if you look at it, here again, this involves President Cory Aquino issuing proclamation number one, announcing that she was the president, and I think Salvador Laurel as her vice president. Now, this was the basis for the Aquino government uh, to install precisely that new revolutionary government as a result of the direct exercise of the power of the Filipino people through the EDSA revolution. Now, here comes Petitioner, Lawyers League of the Philippines, headed by, I think, Attorney Lozano. They tried to question the legitimacy of the Aquino administration. Ingon nila, dili mani legitimate nga gobyerno ning under kay Aquino, kay wala mani this was not done through any constitutional means. This was done through extra legal means. So they tried to, this was not established by the 1973 constitution, the predecessor constitution. So they said, uh, this government uh, is invalid. All right? Now, so did the Supreme Court actually assume jurisdiction over these petitions? Actually, these were petitions for declaratory relief. For now, I will, don't. Uh, for now, you don't need to know what declaratory relief is. But in relation to our topic, 
because they wanted to question the Aquino government, the legitimacy of the Aquino government, the Supreme Court said that, the, number one, the petitioners have no personality to sue and have no state of action. Uh, we will get to standing in our next meeting on the theory of judicial review. But for now, just take note that in this case, in these cases of um, Lawyers League versus Aquino as well as in the Bermudez, what was at issue here was the legitimacy of the Aquino government. And the Supreme Court said that the legit legitimacy of the Aquino government is not a justiciable matter. Okay? Dili siya justiciable matter. Dili makadeside ang Supreme Court ana. Nga no. Because it belongs, according to the court, it belongs to the realm of politics where only the people of the Philippines are the judge. And the people have made judgment. In fact, uh, if you look at it, the Supreme Court even said that all 11 members of the court have already sworn to uphold the fundamental law of the Republic under her government. So mga justices, nag-support na kay Aquino. Ang military, nag-support na kay Aquino. Uh, the Aquino government was both a de facto, de facto and de jure government. And in fact, all the other nations around the world already recognize Cory Aquino and the legitimacy of the Aquino government. So the Supreme Court said, we cannot take uh, cognizance of this case because it's it's not a justiciable matter. Na decide na na sa tao. Okay? You get that? That's, those are the cases of um, Bermudez and um, Lawyers League. Alright. The adoption, look at your outline. The adoption and effectivity of the present constitution. You have Article 5 of the Provisional Constitution as well as Section 27 Article 18 of the 1987 Constitution. What does this state? <clears throat> it states that the Constitution shall take effect immediately upon its ratification by a majority of the votes cast in a plebiscite held for the purpose and shall supersede all previous constitutions. All right? And you have the case of De Leon versus Esguerra. But before that, this is one of the questions which I asked, all right, in uh, the module that I gave you. Question, when did the 1987 Constitution take effect? When? Kinsay When did the 1987 Constitution take effect? February 2, 1987. February 2, 1987. Miss Diala, why do you say that it was February 2, 1987? It was said in the proclamation, sir, that it would be effective on the plebiscite day. And what was the plebiscite day? It was uh, February 2, 1987, sir. All right. Compare that to the effectivity of statutes. You are under Attorney Galas in your persons and family relations, correct? Yes, sir. You have already discussed Article 2 on the publication of laws? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You have already discussed Tanyada versus Tubera as well as EO 200, correct? Yes, yes sir. Oh, sir. Yes, sir. You try to reconcile that. Miss Diala. Miss Caponita, how do you try to reconcile that? My favorite middle. Um, I think, sir, because uh, since it was stated in the Constitution itself, its um, date of effectivity, hence, um, since Article 2 of the New Civil Code states that the effectivity should be after its publication unless stated otherwise. So it was stated in the Constitution, when will it be, uh, when, when will it take Will it take effect? So it was provided there, sir. So once it was published, sir, so that's the time that it took its effect, which is Feb 2, 1987. But the 1987 Constitution was not published yet, Miss Cabunita. Ah, it wasn't published yet, pala, sir. Diba? Oh, why is that? Diba? Because the law itself or the Constitution itself stated 
that it should take effect on the day of the plebiscite. Remember, there's a difference between the constitu Constitution and other statutes. Diba? The Constitution, we said that the Constitution is the fundamental, basic, and supreme law of the land. We also mentioned the doctrine of constitutional supremacy in that um, no act or law is considered above the Constitution. It must always be consistent with the Constitution. Meaning if there is any law or ordinance that goes against or violates the Constitution, the Constitution will always prevail. Diba? I told you that last meeting. So if you look at it, it took effect on February 2, 1987 because the Constitution itself stated uh, that it would take effect on the day of the plebiscite. That was the intent of the framers of the Constitution. Alright, so since so, maski pag wala na publish, nag-take effect na ang 1987 Constitution on February 2, 1987. Okay, take note of that. Compared to statutes, uh, di ba, Tanyana versus Tovera, this involves Marcos using uh, his legislative powers to make certain presidential decrees. Did you discuss that with Attorney Galas? Yes, sir. So, there's yes, no sir. better reason to discuss that than her. She was also my persons and family relations uh, professor. So, di ba, the Supreme Court said there that for laws to take effect, publication is an indispensable requirement. Di ba? Katong unless otherwise provided by law, <coughs> mora tong 15 days, on sa ba, pero kailangan i-publish. Di ba? And again, what is the ratio decidendi or the reason behind publication? Precisely, you have the maxim of ignorantia legis, neminem excusat. Di ba? Ignorance of the law excuses no one from compliance therewith. How can you know the law, uh, you have to know the law even if you, I mean, you have to follow the law even if you don't know it. Diba? Ignorance of the law excuses no one. And how can you know the law if it's not even published? Diba? Kung saan mo pagkabalo sa balaod, no, wak man nga publish. Kung niya, mabiolate din mo, pasangin lang ka. Di pwede. Diba? That's why it has to be published. I will not anymore get into the ruling in Tanyada versus Tuvera because Attorney Galas is more than capable than me to teach you uh, on the publication of laws. Going back to our topic, so it took effect on the day of the plebiscite on February 2, 1987. Now, let's look at the case of De Leon versus Esguerra. All right. In De Leon versus Esguerra, this highlights why the, uh, the effectivity of the 1987 constitution. What happened in De Leon versus Esguerra? Remember, De Leon here was an elected barangay captain together with uh, several uh, barangay councillors in uh, a certain barangay Dolores municipality of Taytay, that's in Rizal. Now, what happened? Remember that uh, they were elected under BP 222 or the Barangay Election Act. And here, on February, the dates here are important uh, in this case. Uh, the dates here are important. Why? On February 9, De Leon received a memorandum from the then OIC Governor Esguerra designating another person, here uh, I think it, he was uh, Magno, as the barangay captain of their barangay. And here, the Governor Esguerra based his authority on the Provisional Constitution saying na pwede niya pulihan. So, De Leon here and his companions filed a case before the Supreme Court saying that their terms of office were fixed to, uh, to six years which shall commence from June 7, 1988 and continue until they have been, uh, until their term is uh, finished. So the issue here is, look at it. De Leon Siyang kapitan na elect. <clears throat> Gipulihan siya sa laing kapitan. Kay gisugo sa <coughs> then Governor Esguerra <coughs> sometime on February 9. You get the facts? He based his authority, the governor, 
to replace the, the barangay captain because of the provisional constitution. Question, on February 9, was the provisional constitution still in effect? No, it was no longer in effect. Look at the date, February 9. Kano saan nag ang 1987 Constitution? 2 pa, sir. February 2. Therefore, the authority granted to the to, uh, Governor Esguera pursuant to the Provisional Constitution was no longer valid precisely because the Provisional Constitution was no longer in effect on February 9. Pagpuli sa ilaha. Ang nag take effect na is the 1987 Constitution, which was on February 2. Therefore, the authority on which Governor Esguera based no, uh, his authority to replace this barangay Captain De Leon is no longer in force and effect. Uh, the OIC governor could no longer rely on the specific uh, section under the provisional constitution because the 1987 constitution had already uh, taken effect. That's the case of De Leon versus Esguera. You get that? You get that? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so, looking at the outline, uh, comparing that with the effectivity of statutes, again, Tanyada versus Tuvera as well as EO 200, so, uh, you just take note of that, okay? Humana naman mo, Anna, okay? Now, uh, there's this, there's also this issue, some people say, remember, plebiscite katong na binutuhay, kung okay na ba o dili sila sa 1987 Constitution. Remember, wala ba yada yun na natabulate, okay? Pag inihapay, natabulate na, I think, February 11 na, alright? But, Nga nung February 2, gihapon nag-take effect. Nga nung delay February 11. Here, you have to look at ratification vis-a-vis -vis tabulation. It remember, the act ratification is the act of voting by the people. So when it was voted upon by the people on February 2, that was the day the Constitution take, took effect. The act of tabulation was merely the mathematical confirmation of what was done during the date of the plebiscite. In fact, in this case, <coughs> I like the concurring opinion by uh, Chief Justice Tihanki saying that the 1987 Constitution took effect on February 2, which was the date of its ratification in the plebiscite held on the same day. The February 11, 1987 occurrence is merely the mathematical confirmation of what was already decided by the people on February 2. And it, so meaning it was merely confirmed on February 2. I mean, on Feb, uh, February 11. But it actually took effect on February 2, 1987. You get that? You get that? Questions? Nan? Nasabtan do nasabtan bitaw wala. Nasabtan sir. Copy sir. Nasabtan kay very basic na on the constitution. Did you get that? Yes sir. Yes sir. Okay. All right. Again, I only told you I told you how we're only going to be holding class until 6 6. So one hour lang ta magklase kay napakoy lakaw. All right. Um Judicial elaboration of the Constitution, okay? How do we interpret uh, the Constitution, all right? Remember, the Constitution is not a lawyer's document. Ha? Precisely, the Constitution is made in very simple terms para masabtan sa tao. How do we interpret the Constitution? Well, some authors say you use verbal edges or whenever the words... Whenever possible, when the, the words are used in their ordinary meaning. So, kung say pasabot dito sa word, mo gito. Or if you look at it in the light of the history and circumstances, 
you have to interpret the Constitution in accord with the spirit. Diba? They were framers of the Constitution. Diba? You have to interpret not by the letter that killeth, but by the spirit that giveth life. So you have to look at the, the intent or the spirit of the framers of the Constitution. That is how you try to interpret the Constitution. All right? Now, if you look at your outline, how do you try to construct or construction of the 1987 Constitution? First, you have the case of Manila Prince Hotel versus GSIS. I assume you have already read this case. Correct? I hope I'm assuming right. Have you read yes, this case? Sir. Yes, sir. Oh. Yes. In Manila Prince Hotel, diba this, the controversy arose when the respondent GSIS decided to sell through public bidding, I think 51% of Manila Hotel. Okay? So, ibaligya nilang Manila Hotel. At that time, night duha ka bidder. The first was Manila Prince Hotel Corporation, a Filipino corporation. They offered to buy 51% of the shares. The other one was a Malaysian firm, Renong Berhad, I think, who also tried to buy the shares. Now, during the bidding, uh, uh, it was the Malaysian firm that actually won the bidding. So the petitioners here, Manila Prince Hotel Corporation, filed the case saying that since Manila Hotel was part of the national patrimony, it, was, it should be the petitioner that should be preferred because it matched man the bid of the Malaysian firm. Therefore, it should be awarded in favor of <coughs> Manila Prince Hotel Corporation. And what did they use as basis? They used as basis a certain article under the Constitution, specifically Article 12, Section 10, Subparagraph 2 of the 1987 Constitution. And what does it provide? It just states merely, in the grant of rights, privileges, and concessions covering the national economy and patrimony, the state shall give preference to qualified Filipinos. This is what we call the Filipino first policy. So, in under the Constitution, pag abut sa rights, privileges, o concession, bahin sa national economy o national patrimony, dapat tagaan o preference, tagaan o pabor ang mga Filipino. In this case of Manila Princess GSIS, they use this provision saying na. Manila uh, Hotel is uh, part of the national patrimony. So, dapat kung naibiding ang Pilipino na corporation ang paboran, ang Pilipino na corporation ang i-prefer compared sa Malaysian uh, firm or corporation. You get the facts in this case? <coughs> so, the issue is, first, whether or not this Article 12, Section 10, second paragraph is what we call a self-executing provision. Okay? Thus, we now go to the distinction. Self-executing versus non-self-executing provisions. How do you now differentiate? A self-executing provision needs no further guideline or implementing law or legislation. You can already use it directly as a basis for your right. It is per se already judicially enforceable. Okay? If I told you before, um, Article 3, the Bill of Rights, diba Section 2, I, I told you the requisites of the search warrant or warrant of arrest. Diba? Section 2, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures of whatever nature and for any purpose shall be inviolable except, uh, uh, except uh, a, a lawful uh, a warrant of arrest or search warrant to be determined personally by the judge after examination uh, under affirmation or oath of the complainant or the witnesses to be produced, particularly describing the place to be searched or persons or things to be seized, diba? That article, that section on your right against uh, unreasonable searches and seizures, that you can use as a basis for your right 
that is already what we call a self-executing pwede na nimo magamit self-executing there's no need for any uh, it's already judicially enforceable so kung nai nisulod si mong balay nga walay warat you can already use section 2 because it's a self-executing provision it's already a source of your rights all right a basis for your rights compare that to non-self-executing provisions precisely from the word itself non-self-executing you cannot use it as a basis for your right it still needs enabling legislation meaning it's just a guide okay ang non-self-executing provision now going back to the case of Ma manila prince hotel the supreme court said that this uh, particular section in the constitution this filipino first policy which gives preference to qualified filipinos this is a self-executing provision all right now next question is manila prince hotel since this provision is self-executing whether or not Manila Prince Hotel falls under the term national patrimony. Okay? Kasi dili lang mantanan, paboran ang Pinoy all times. The Constitution is clear. In the grant of rights, privileges, and concessions, only covering the national economy and patrimony. So you have to prove now whether Manila Hotel was part of the national patrimony. And the Supreme Court said actually, yes. It's part of the national patrimony because it is a cultural heritage for the Filipinos. If you look at Manila Hotel in the 1950s, 60s, they had nagagira sa mga hapon. It was where dignitaries would be welcomed. All the important events already happened in Manila Hotel. So it is really part of our culture na ang kaning Manila Prince Hotel. I mean Manila Hotel. So because of that, the Supreme Court uh, categorized Manila Hotel as part of the national patrimony. Therefore, uh, the Supreme Court held that uh, it upheld the Filipino first policy, that this was a self-executing provision, and that Manila Prince Hotel Corporation should be awarded the bid instead of uh, the Malaysian firm. Okay, So Manila Prince Hotel was correct that this is a self-executing provision. A provision which is non-self-executing just lays down a general principle. These principles are only guiding principles. So you remember, kung non-self-executing, nag-guide lang ni, okay? Dili ni siya automatically a basis for your rights. Like, if you look at the current 1987 Constitution, Look at Article 2, the Declaration of Principles and State Policies. Most, I said most, not all, because there's a provision there which is a self-executing provision. Most of the provisions under the Declaration of Principles, uh, Declaration of Principles and State Policies, they are mostly non-self-executing provisions, meaning they are merely guides, meaning there is still a need for enabling legislation for it to for you to invoke it as part of your right. Okay. Now, we know the difference between self-executing and non-self-executing provisions. If there's any ambiguity as to how provisions in the Constitution must be interpreted, whether executing or self-executing, take note that under the Declaration of Policies, the presumption is always in favor of self-execution unless it is expressly provided by the legislative act that uh, legislative act it's necessary to enforce a constitutional mandate going back finally to the case of manila prince hotel the court declared that section 10 paragraph 2 article 12 is a self-executing provision it is a mandatory positive command which is complete in itself and which needs no further guidelines or implementing laws or rules for its enforcement. That is the ruling. All right? <coughs> um, under Manila Prince Hotel. All right? Now, there's this argument nga, 
pwede man mag-issue gihapon og laws pursuant to this policy, will that make the provision not self-executing? No. Self-executing provisions do not preclude laws. There's also this other argument here saying that unfair daw for foreigners who want to invest in the country. Kaya nga nung tagaan daw o preference ang mga Pinoy. Alright? But take note, there is no discrimination here because the Constitution provides that the Filipinos must first be qualified. So kung, dili, so kung, kung qualified ay ang, ang foreigner, ang Pilipino dili, dili, pwede ka po ng Pinoy. Dili, lugi. Okay? At the same time, this only involves the grant of rights, privileges, and concessions involving the national economy and patrimony. If it's not involving the national economy and patrimony, uh, patrimony wala'y labot. You get that? Okay? Now take note, ha? Uh, patrimony, this is found in the uh, preamble. Okay? Take note also that the preamble is merely an introduction to the Constitution. It's a prologue. Kung baga. Di ba? The preamble, you cannot use it as a source for your rights. I'm sure you have memorized the preamble during your uh, college days. Gipamemorize mo mayan sa gipamemorize mo ani sa inyong maestro. Elementary sir. Oh, elementary pa lang. Yes, the sovereign Tanaol. Paul, employ the aid of Almighty God in order to build a just and humane society and establish a government that shall embody our ideals and aspirations, promote the common good, conserve and develop our patrimony. Oh, di ba? Diha ni gawas and to secure to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of independence and democracy under the rule of law and regime of truth, justice, freedom, love, equality, and peace, do ordain and promulgate this constitution. The preamble is merely an introduction. Pero some constitutions have preambles, some do not. Pero ang kagwapo lang sa preamble, it just envisions what society we hope to have in the Philippines. Alright? Naka state diha, okay? It's called the preamble from the Latin or Greek term preambular, which means to walk before. Mo nang meaning sa preamble, preambular, to walk before. So mura siya introduction lang sa constitution. Pero dili gyud siya kanang uh, basis for your rights, unlike the provisions under the Bill of Rights under Article 3. All right? Now, the plain meaning of the constitution. It is again I told you that the Constitution is not a lawyer's document. Its language is understood in the sense that it may have in, in the common, in common, the word should be given its ordinary meaning, except where technical terms are involved. All right? Next case in the outline to, to illustrate uh, executing versus self-executing provisions is the case of Pamatong versus Comelec. Have you also already read this case, Pamatong versus Comelec? Yes? Hello? Yes, the basa ni? Tumbag? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, okay. Now, in this case of Pamatong, you know Reverend Eli Pamatong. You've heard him, you've read him, you've heard it on the news, you've read him in the newspaper, about him in the newspaper. Mori isang tao nga si Daga Presidente. Okay? Now, what happened? Here, when Reverend Eli Pamatong filed a certificate of candidacy to run for the position of President of the Republic of the Philippines, the Comelec declared him as a nuisance candidate who could not wage a nationwide campaign uh, was not nominated by a political party or supported by a registered political party with a national constituency. In short, si Pamatong gusto mo dagan ng presidente. Dili siya kadagan kay gideclare ng nuisance candidate sa Comilec. So here comes Eli Pamatong going to the Supreme Court saying that under the Constitution, particularly Article 2, Section 26, or what we call the equal access provision. Ingon niya, nga pwede siya makadagan tungod aning 
uh, equal access provision because uh, under if you look at article 2 section 26 uh, there should be equal access to opportunities for public service that is the article in uh, section 26 okay i'll read the exact provision under section 26 ah huh? this is article 2 kasi section 26 the state shall guarantee equal access to opportunities for public service and prohibit political dynasties as may be defined by law all right so in on there is a constitutional provision the state shall guarantee equal access to opportunity for public service. So, yun ni pamatong, o equal man ang access, dapat padaganon kung presidente. Kay equal ko dapat ang access using this provision under Article 2, Section 26. Nga nung i-declare man ko as nuisance candidate, kunya as a result, dili na yun ko kadagan as uh, President of the Republic of the Philippines. Question. Uh, could he run or wh whether or not there's a constitutional right to hold public office? And more importantly, in relation to our topic, whether or not he could use Article uh, Article 2, Section 26, or what we call the Equal Access Provision, as a basis for his right. Can he use Article 2, Section 26? Supreme Court said, no. He cannot use Section 26. Why? Section 26 is merely a privilege subject to limitations imposed by law. It neither bestows such a right nor elevates the privilege to the level of an enforceable right. Therefore, long story short, it is a non-self-executing provision. Dili ni mo siya magamit, di ba? Pag non-self-executing, you cannot use this as a basis for your right. Kaning equal access provision. Alright? So it is a non-self-executing provision. Therefore, you cannot use this as a basis for your right. In fact, if you look at it from a practical standpoint, the Comelec had every right to declare him a nuisance candidate. Why? If you read the case in its full text, again, I state in its full text and not just the digest, which most of you are doing, I hope not, ang ingon din to, grabe ang masave sa Comelec kung mamainusan ang mga pangalan dito sa linya sa balota. Remember, di ba, sa balota na yung mga pangalan niya? If you erase one name and one line there because he's declared a nuisance candidate, the Comelec would be saving millions sa pagpaprint sa balota anang pangalana na di mangyapon ka daog. Wala may support sa national party. Na walay national machinery to conduct a national or nationwide campaign. Therefore, he should be declared a what we call nuisance candidate. Imagine na lang kung sila tanan, padaganon, didagan kay ilang pangalan sa balota, di yapon sila ka daog. Dako kay gastos ang komelek. So you get the reason behind it. That's why the komelek or the omnibus election code allows the Comelec to declare certain persons as nuisance candidates. And Eli Pamatong is one example of what we call a nuisance candidate when he filed his certificate of candidacy to run for the President of the Republic of the Philippines. But in relation to our topic on whether or not he could use the equal access provision, he cannot use this as a basis for his rights precisely because this is what we call a self executing provision. You get that? You get that? Okay? Yes, sir. All right. Fine. Uh, and look at your outline. The theory of judicial review. Separation of powers. Okay? I told you previous meeting that we have three branches of government. The executive, the legislative and the judicial branch. Don't worry, isa isa ho na ko na sa tong discussion on constitutional law. But remember, these branches are separate yet co-equal branches. Walay branch nga mas lamang. Pareho sila pantay-pantay, executive, legislative, judicial branch. Even if they are separate, 
distinct branches, they are co-equal branches, yet each have their own function, each have their own power. To sum it up, the executive branch executes the law. The legislative branch legislates, it makes the law. The judicial branch, it interprets the law. So na yung mga separation of powers, each branch na responsibility. Okay? That's the beauty of our democracy. Separation of powers as well as the principle of checks and balances where one branch tries to check the other power of the other branch para to assure that there is no abuse of power. Those two principles come hand in hand. The principle of separation of powers and the principle of checks and balances. Now, this, these two principles are best embodied in the cases which uh, I gave in the outline. We'll just discuss this um, in passing, no? Ang kaning different uh, cases, all right? First, you have this very old case of Angara versus Electoral Commission. Here, I think what happened here was the Provincial Board of Canvassers proclaimed Angara as a member-elect of the National Assembly and he took his oath. On December 3, there was uh, the National Assembly passed a resolution which declared with finality the victory of Angara. Again, look at the dates here. Ang National Assembly nag-ingon nga December 3, daog na ka Angara. December 3. December 8, na ay nag-file in Suwa before the Electoral Commission, nag-file siya of protest against Angara. What did the Electoral Commission say? The Electoral Commission said, okay, the deadline for uh, the for the protest involving these positions is December 9. Meaning December 9 is the last day for the filing of a protest against the election, return, and qualification of any member of the National Assembly. So, here, they say, Giri naman pwede. Look at the dates. Ingun sa National Assembly, December 3 lang kutob ang deadline. Kaya na-confirm naman. Ingun po sa Electoral Commission, dili, December 9 ang deadline. And nag-file si Insua, December 8. You get the facts? The, ingon sa National Assembly, December 3. Ingon sa um, Electoral Commission, dili December 3, December 9 ang deadline. Nag-file si Insua, December 8. Question, pwede ba nga makag-entertain uh, gihapon ng electoral protest ang Electoral Commission? Pwede ba? What did the Supreme Court say? Look at the specific power of the agency involved. Here you have the National Assembly, that's Congress. What's the main trabaho sa Congress under the doctrine of separation of powers? To legislate, to make laws. Whereas the Electoral Commission, what's the power sa Electoral Commission? Under the Constitution, the Electoral Commission is the sole judge, S-O-L-E, sole judge of all contests relating to the election, returns, and qualifications of members of the National Assembly. In short, kinsay in charge? Kinsay na power ana ang National Assembly or ang Electoral Commission? Supreme Court said it was the Electoral Commission that had jurisdiction being the sole judge of all contests relating to the election, return, and qualification of members of the National Assembly. Therefore, the uh, Electoral Commission was acting within the legitimate exercise of its constitutional prerogative in taking cognizance of the electoral protest filed by INSUA. You get that? Okay? To show uh, this uh, doctrine of separation of powers, Next case, Tawang MPC versus La Trinidad. Tawang MPC is basically, I, if you try to read it, it's it's a complicated case, but actually it's really quite easy. Tawang Multipurpose Cooperative is a registered cooperative which provides domestic water services in La Trinidad, Benguet. 
So when it tried to apply for a certificate of public convenience, giarangan ni sa Latinidad Water District. Kay nga, no. So nag-file ang tawang MTC. Mga yung may certificate of public convenience para sa tubig. Giharang sa Latinidad. Ingon sa Latinidad, hili mo pwede tagaan o certificate of public convenience kay under sa PD sa Balaod, ha? under PD 198, Section 47, kami lang ang naay exclusive franchise. So, dili mo tagaan kay kami ra'y pwede. Muna ang facts. Sa kaso, question, can there be what we call an exclusive franchise when it comes to kaning mga cooperatives to uh, to authorize water supply sa isa ka lugar? Okay? What did the Supreme Court say? The Supreme Court said the President, Congress, or even the Court cannot create indirect, cannot, the Court cannot do directly what they cannot do indirectly. Ingon sa Constitution, nga bawal man nga mag-exclusive uh, ka sa franchise regarding, any, especially sa tubig, okay? Which is a public utility. So the Supreme Court said, You cannot, okay? The Supreme Court said to quote the ruling of the Supreme Court: the President, Congress, and the Court cannot create indirectly franchises that are exclusive in character by allowing the Board of Directors of a water district and a local water utilities administration to create franchises that are exclusive in character. Ingon ba sa Supreme Court? Dili na pwede. Ay, ingon sa Constitution. Dili na pwede exclusive. Alright? So the court held na dili yung pwede kay mo maingon sa Constitution. Alright? That's the case of Tawang MPC versus Latinidad. Alright? Next case of Metro Bank versus Tobias. You will learn this more in your criminal law. Criminal law ninyo si Fiscal Razon. Correct? Oh, he is a very brilliant prosecutor. This is recorded. Oh. He's a very brilliant prosecutor. I will leave to him criminal law. But for now, kaning Metro Bank versus Tobias. I think ma Tobias here, a case for falsification. I think falsification was uh, filed. I stopped through falsification. I think it's 172 uh, of the revised penal code. Kay nag submit daw siya og fictitious title sa Metro Bank kay nangutang. Di ba nangutang manghatag og collateral. Naghatag og piki daw kulo ka titulo. Now, when a case was filed against him, the DOJ uh, dismissed the case because he was in good faith now. Okay? So when, but Metro Bank uh, moved to reconsider and they went to the Court of Appeals. So Metro Bank now maintains that the Secretary of Justice did what the, what the Secretary of the Justice did was to determine the innocence of the accused during the preliminary investigation. Okay? Question. Can the Secretary of Justice, during preliminary investigation, rule that there was no probable cause, hence the case should be dismissed? Is it within the power, is it within the prerogative of the Department of Justice to conduct that preliminary investigation? Yes. Why? Under the doctrine of separation of powers, kaya di ba na ngayon reconsideration from the court ang Metro Bank, so nidagan sa sa korte para ipabalik tad ang DOJ ng finding no probable cause. Here, although there are exceptions to this, you learned that in your criminal procedure. Here, the ruling was the courts have no right to directly decide over matters which, for which full discretionary authority has been delegated to the executive branch of government or to substitute their own judgment for that of the executive branch represented in this case by the Department of Justice. Tanawa, judicial branch. Ingon sa judicial branch, sa Supreme Court, ang power to make preliminary investigation under sa DOJ. Ang DOJ, di ba, under the office of the president? So, executive branch. So, ingon sa judicial branch, the Supreme Court, trabaho man na sa 
executive branch under the doctrine of separation of powers. Diba? You have the DOJ, the DOJ secretary under the office of the president. The settled policy, take note of this, the settled policy is that courts will not interfere with the executive determination of probable cause for the purpose of filing an information unless there is grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction. All right? And that abuse of discretion must be so patent and so gross as to amount to an invasion of a positive duty or a virtual refusal to perform a duty enjoined by law. In short, ang in-charge sa preliminary investigation, ang DOJ under the executive branch, under the doctrine of separation of powers. So ang judicial branch, di siya maglabot-labot unless there is grave abuse of discretion. That's the case of Metro Bank versus Tobias. Okay? And the last two cases of Civil Service Commission versus Ramoneda Pita, I think Ramon read Ramoneda Pita here is just a, a clerk and a clerk three of the MTC. Pag court employee, always remember, because these were uh, cases filed before the Civil Service Commission against this court employee. The Supreme Court just said that when it comes to the discipline of these court employees and court personnel, it must always be under the Supreme Court dili under the Civil Service Commission. No other branch of government may intrude into this power without running afoul the doctrine of separation of powers. Okay? And finally, the case of Garcia versus Drilon. Garcia versus Drilon is a landmark case because basically it tries to question the constitutionality of Republic Act 9262 or what we call the Anti-Violence Against Women and Children Act. Okay? Diba, if you've read this law, uh, diba, na ay physical abuse. Pero when it comes to abuse, hindi lang physical eh. Physical abuse, emotional abuse, uh, psychological abuse, even financial abuse. This is included under the under Republic Act 9262. All right? They tried to question the constitutionality of this based on the wisdom of the law. Kay dili daw tama nga no daw nga babae lang. What about lalaki? Mga battered husbands like me. Okay? Nga no daw wala day violence against men. Okay? But that's just a joke, ha? Huh? They tried to question the constitutionality based on the wisdom. Now, if you actually read the entire uh, case, uh, there are really studies which show na grabe yun ang abuse sa women. All right? There's this battered woman syndrome. But with regard to our topic, the Supreme Court just said, courts are not concerned with the wisdom, justice, policy or expediency of a statute under the principle of separation of powers. Kinsay magbuot kung unsang klaseng balaod ang himuon. Ang legislative branch. Ang legislative branch ang magingon kung kinahanglan ba? Kung maayo ba? When it comes to the wisdom or necessity or expediency of a law, that belongs within the realm of the legislative branch. The court, which is another separate branch, cannot uh, strike down this as unconstitutional based solely on the necessity or the wisdom of the law, precisely because there is this principle of separation of powers. Ang legislative man ang in charge sa paghimo sa balaod. So when it comes to the wisdom, kung tama bang balaod o dili, dili maglabot-labot ang korte. Okay? Unless there is grave abuse of discretion. Court, the court said, Congress has made its choice and it is not our prerogative to supplant this judgment. Okay? By the principle of separation of powers, 
it is the legislative branch that that determines the necessity, adequacy, wisdom, and expediency of any law. We only step in if there is a violation of the Constitution. However, none was sufficiently shown in this case. Hence, the case was dismissed. And the Anti-Violence Against Women and Children Act or law was declared as not unconstitutional. Now, why do I say not unconstitutional? Because if you look at your outline, there is this principle of constitutionality. It, an act or the law is presumed constitutional. That's why you say it's not unconstitutional because it is already presumed as constitutional. That's why you have that case of Perez versus People wherein they tried to declare as unconstitutional certain... Uh, 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 because he was being charged with several criminal cases, he said that this was unconstitutional in violation of his rights under the Bill of Rights, but he did not uh, show any proof to support that. So the Supreme Court just said here, under the principle of... Uh, under the presumption of constitutionality, all statutes, laws, and even the Constitution... They are presumed to be constitutional. That's why it's more appropriate to say that an act or statute is not unconstitutional rather than saying it is constitutional. Why? Because there is that presumption of constitutionality under this case of uh, Perez versus uh, people. You get that? All right? Now, uh, I also gave questions in your... Um, in our Google uh, Classroom, I'll just search. I think we were able to answer all of them in my discussion tonight uh, on constitutional law, on the principle of uh, constitutional supremacy. But I'll just check whether I was able to answer. Ah, you have this case on the K-12, all right? It was uh, here in this case. It the K to twelve was still declared as constitutional. I you just read that case. That's the case of. Let me check uh, here. That's the case of. Ayan, Council of Teachers versus Secretary of Education. Okay. You just read that case that involves the K-12 case, a K-12 program of the government, uh, and that was still declared as uh, not unconstitutional. So it was valid. And finally, this case of Mangtoto versus Manguera, which I gave as a question, as an assignment in your module, this just involves the application of the Constitution. This will be our final topic for tonight. Is the, should the Constitution be applied only prospectively or can it be applied retroactively? Okay? Diba in this case of Maktoto, there was a certain confession and this confession was made without the assistance of counsel. Alright? If you look at the Bill of Rights, alright, in the 1973, this is, I also teach the Bill of Rights in Second Sem. In the 1973 and 87 Constitution. In the 1987 Constitution, we have what we call your Miranda rights, kind of right to remain silent, right to have a competent counsel, as well as your right of, against self incrimination, the section 17, I think, of the Bill of Rights. No person shall be compelled to be a witness against himself. This was found in one section, I think section 20, in the 1973 Constitution. Long story short, there was a confession, okay? Whether that confession was admissible, despite the fact that it was taken before the 1973 Constitution. So the issue came up, can the... Because if the confession was made without counsel, dili pwede, nagi pogos, dili pwede, under the 1973 and 87 Constitution. Problema, Wala pa may atong nga provision before the 73 Constitution. 
So the Supreme Court said it was admissible, although there were many dissenting opinions to this. Supreme Court said the Constitution should only be applied prospectively. It cannot be applied retroactively or balik. Compare that to penal statutes. Diba you have Article 22 of the Revised Penal Code? Nana mo sa Article 22 under kay Fiscal Rezon? Wala pa. Wala pa, sir. Wala pa, sir. I will let him explain that. But long story short, penal statutes are given retroactive effect if they are favorable to the accused. Pwede nga retroactive kung pabor sa akusado. Pero that only involves penal statutes. Mora na ang pwede nga retroactive effect. Compare that to the Constitution in the Supreme Court in the case of Bangtoto versus Manguera, it should be applied prospectively and not retroactively compared to criminal statutes. You get that? That's the case of Bangtoto versus uh, Manguera. All right? Questions? Clarifications? Nakuha, pas pas kay ko was the was it clear? Was it may ano? Clear, clear, sir. Clear, sir. Okay lang. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, pa. Okay. We're adapting to the new normal. I'm also really not uh, accustomed to this. I like lecturing face to face, but we have to adapt. So um, that we'll just uh, finish here. For next meeting, we'll start with the conditions for the exercise of judicial review. So, uh, I'll try uh, calling some persons the next meeting. And I'll, by next week, I'll be uploading more modules for you to read in advance. So that when we discuss, kabalo na mudaan sa cases and sa topics para paspas atong uh, discussion. But we'll be focusing on the theory of judicial review, the requirements of locustandi, uh, Lismota, you just read on the mootness as well as the functions of judicial review and um, uh, the other topics in the outline including political question vis-a-vis -vis justiciable question. All right? All that we'll be tackling next week. All right? Questions? None? Clarifications? None? Okay. Thank you. Stay safe. Uh, see you next week. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, sir. Clarify lang po. Oh, clarification. Mutaan namin ako. Ay, dili, sir. Sabi mo kasi, sir. See you next week. So, ngayong Friday, sir. Friday man ngayon, di ba? Ay, hala. Oh, my God. Sama. Oh, sorry, sir. Okay na, sir. Okay na, sir. Relax to be in Friday. Okay? So, see you on Friday. Okay? Bye, sir. Any other clarifications as to what day of the week it is? Wala. Oh, sige. See you next week. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.